This is the podcast of INCACT, the European Network on Cultural Management and Policy. In this series, we interview extraordinary professionals from the cultural management and policy community. Join us to hear their stories, the secrets of their success, and their advice for creating innovation by inspiring new policies and practices in the cultural, education, and research sector. Welcome to the Encarta Podcast Channel, a space where we need to talk and reflect about cultural management and policy education and practice. My name is Gianelia Cogliandro Bayens, and today I'd like to invite you to listen to this special podcast series devoted to the NCAT Congress, a major event organized in Helsinki from the 11th to the 13th of October 2023. At this occasion, our global community converged to explore the theme of artificial intelligence, a theme that is not just relevant, but also profoundly transformative for the culture and creative sectors. In this five episode recorded at the occasion of our Congress, expect to hear the voice of leading experts and truly visionary people who are not just embracing the future, they are all actively shaping it through their practice and policies. They will talk about the impact of artificial intelligence on artistic expression, the evolution of policy and cultural institutions in the digital age, the change to be done in terms of leadership in an artificial intelligence context, and much more. In this episode, recorded at the occasion of our Congress, you will listen to Professor Luis Bonnet, winner of the 2023 edition of the NCAT Outstanding Award. This unique recognition was granted to Professor Louis Bonnet for his exceptional scholarship in cultural management and policy, for his academic and professional career, for his consistent contribution to education and research in the field of cultural management and policy, and last but not least for his innovative and interdisciplinary approach, both in terms of policy and practice. Professor Louis Bonnet was identified by a global outstanding jury as a transformational leader and a key personality of the cultural field, whose work has impacted at local, national and international level. In this episode, he will present his view about leadership and, in particular, he will share his recipe for being a transformative leader. I truly hope that this podcast will give you new perspective and inspiring advice on how to be a good leader in these challenging times, profoundly changed by the artificial intelligence, the COVID pandemic, and the digital shift. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I'm not a specialist of artificial intelligence. So when I was thinking which kind of keynote I can do in this very specific topic of a conference, I thought, okay, thanks God, I wrote a book on innovation on cultural management. This book is published in Spanish, but uh, uh, you will get my lecture translated to a chapter of a new book that Ankat is preparing. In a way, you also will be able to read my thoughts in English. So that's why I decided to propose this title, Driving Innovation in Cultural Management. So I will focus not, I won't talk about innovation in the cultural field, I will talk about innovation in cultural management. So the first confusion is that many people think that innovation is connected only to technology. And this is not true, we know that. Some people even think that just the phone cells, it's enough. 
the real innovation in traditional culture, this uh, expression of Catalan traditional culture, is not because there are people using smartphones or other kind of technologies, is because they are now achieving the best levels of quality through innovation, but through innovation, because now they are doing physical and biological analysis to muscles, mass and bone structure to place and train the right people in each place. Now there are women in the towers. And this is not just because our society changed their values, it's also because from a technological innovation point of view, it's much better. They are lighter than men. So also there is the social mediation they're breaking taboos, integrating immigrants into traditional closet collective. This is also an innovation. Or video and drone recording to study in detail and reduce the assembly time of the castle. I think these are other ways of innovation that we as cultural managers, we can propose, we can accompany in the process. And we do that in a milieu where there are many different players. And that is one of the key mediation roles of cultural managers. So we are the ones who encourage the innovation process to accept risk as a great value, at the same time trying to balance the right decisions in uncertain moments. This is part of the job. So this is the key role of cultural managers. But what happens in a specific ecosystem? Ecosystems where the creators, the artists, but also the cultural heritage professionals with their own different backgrounds, the producers, the creators, the managers, and of course, a very large range of users. And these are very important. So in this ecosystem, there are four main areas of innovation. The one that happens specifically in the artistic or heritage field, changing the concepts, changing the expressions, and so on. The innovation connected to creating a main full experience for the audiences, for the communities, for the people. The innovations connected to functionality and format, which of course, all of them are connected. Huh? And finally, the ones connected to governance, and managerial model. I will talk about some of them with some examples. But first of all, I want just to use Manuel Castell's definition because I think it's always useful to understand the difference between creativity and innovation, especially because the cultural sector is perceived as a creative sector by definition, but not always is a good innovative sector. So that is why it's so important that we as cultural managers and we as researchers and educators in this field, we push this change of paradigm from creativity to innovation. So creativity, of course, is a natural attribute of human beings, but it's something that doesn't grow up in all conditions, depends as well of the conditions. So sociopolitical conditions are those unwelcome curiosity and freedom and not in all the world these conditions exist. Or social and economic context encourage seed environments, and this doesn't exist in every place. So we have to be very conscious because we are in a part of the world which are privileged. Privileged because we are in better economic conditions, in better political and social conditions. So we have to have this broad approach and to understand that the situation in other parts of the world is not like it is in Europe. But creativity alone doesn't presuppose implementation of and put it into social value. And this is the commitment. The commitment is transform creativity to innovation. So the innovation, the ability to make viable and to implement creative ideas is our responsibility. We know that that starts that have a transition process, so there are many issues, but mainly what I want to say is that there is a need of accept that risk is in the core of our work. And not always, especially when you work in the public sector, risk is something which is not always very welcome, but it's our task to push in this direction. So we need to overcome the reasons, the factors that not allows this, 
like the ones are here, and at the same time, try to understand the specificities of the cultural sector. So it's a sector with oversupply and self-exploitation of artists. It's a, a sector with limited financial resources. Sometimes as well, there is a lack of management skills as well. And fragmentation in a small and medium-sized enterprises. This is something that don't allow enough resources in order to risk and to go ahead. So that are some of the specificities. But of course, there are other elements which are more general. So do you think it's enough to have a good canvas? Of course, we teach this. And that is part of our methods, but it's not enough. So we need to go farther. We can talk about how innovation grows up in different areas. And this is from the concert of uh, two days ago. So there is, of course, innovation in the projects when there is high expression values, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the kind of aspects who characterize you know, the symbolic, experimental, the non-utilitarian, where aesthetic plays an expressive role. So all these are conditions. We are not doing innovation in the same way that we do in the scientific world or the industry world or in other worlds. We need to understand the specific trends of the cultural sector, of the cultural professionals, in order to accompany them in this process. It's a, always a joint process, a cooperative process. And we also need to understand that in the different cultural sector or subsector areas, in the different value change, innovation could happen in different ways. So some subsectors are more related to technological innovation than others, for instance. So that's why, even though I started my lecture saying that innovation is not always connected to technology, it's clear that technology plays a role. And we have to understand these different roles and how we push in this direction. You know? So these are a little bit the key aspects, but I want to share with you a better or a more large framework. We know that when we talk about innovation, one of the most important issues to think about is process and life cycle. Which kind of life cycle are the best in order to push innovation? Which are the processes? So theory about innovation talks about centralized versus collaborative innovation in the sense that traditionally corporations try to centralize the innovation process in order to win the control of the added value and the added money that this innovation could bring to them. The cultural sector doesn't work in this way because it's much more fragmented, so it's more a cooperative kind of innovation sector. But at the same time, theory of our innovation, when they talk about life cycle, talks about disruptive innovation versus incremental innovation. I think in the cultural sector, in general, the most important thing is this incremental, but not in a continuous way, but in a discontinuous incremental way, which is more risky, but probably is how we have to work with. So I think it's important to have these approaches, comes from the theory of innovation, you probably know that Schumpeter was the one who started to think on this, and after him, many other people. And now I want to connect this with these four areas of innovation. The one who is connected to the artistic and heritage concept, the creation of meaningful experience, the capacity to, through changing functionalities and formats, achieve new innovative processes, and finally, innovation connected to governance models and to managerial models which are probably the ones more close to us, but I think all of them are connected because we have to be drivers of innovation around us. Many innovations involve changes in perceived meaning, new formats and functionalities, and even changes in management and business models, so everything is connected. But we also need to think about the process of recognition of innovation. We know that many innovations never are implemented, really. That's part of the human being evolution process. So key stakeholders 
who recognize the value of innovation, these stakeholders live in an asymmetric world. So this asymmetric influence, depending on each stakeholder involvement, it's important to take into account. One of the things that I teach always to my students is a stakeholder theory based on the asymmetric power of the different typologies of stakeholders. And I think it's very important because that affects the recognition processes. Who are the ones who can say this is valid? And it's a merge, right? There is a different stages of recognition. I think it's important to think of this when we are teaching innovation. The role of the cultural manager is not limited to here, but of course, is a driver of innovation in all these issues. I want just to share with you some examples. Some of these examples are very old ones because innovation in the cultural sector has a very, very long history. So an open atelier, eh? so organized visits by cultural venues, ateliers, special open days, these kind of things. This was an innovation before cultural uh, venues, cultural institutions were not organizing these things. This was an innovation. Or even some very simple things like organizing a talk with artists after a show. That was an innovation that didn't exist before. No? And many other things. If we go to the past, repertoire theater was an innovation in relation to previous forms of performing arts, or soap opera as well. So these are very old innovations, and we can follow the history of culture to, to see this. So the open visits to museum, participatory program, even to propose a selfie space in a monument. This is as well innovation. I don't like it a lot, but in any case, it is an innovation connected to what has sense for the audience and so on and so on. But I think we need to ask ourselves, who are as creator, mediator, and recipient of these new meanings? Because that's, I think, is an important question. Or who perceives innovation and benefits or is harmed from the consequent creation of this kind of value? There are not always positive benefits. Or are there temporary innovation monopolies or is it free to copy and adapt to each local and sectoral context? This is connected to the ecosystem of innovation. And I think these are questions we have to think about because we are taking decisions. And this is the main role of a cultural manager, taking decisions and on uncertain situations. Of course, there are many other kinds of innovation, for instance, new functions and formats from uh, artistic residences. This is something that very normal, what used to be a normal kind of thing, or audio books, or QR signs, or remix, or virtual reality. There are many changes that we are living at this very moment. Specifically, in the case of management and governance, the Italian Baroque theater was an important innovation of management because price discrimination based on seat location supports the income, the growing income for theaters managers. Or co production, international co production, that also was an innovation on the field of management, who allows to share cost to get a larger audiences at international level, et cetera, et cetera. So what I try to say that the innovation process is a very long path. Of course, crowdfunding as using digital platform is a new innovation, but crowdfunding is a very old cultural practice and social practice, of course. Crowdsourcing, monetization of previous amateur content creation like YouTube or Facebook or Instagram is doing, and so on and so on. So that many, many examples of this. So in a way, what interests me is to try to understand for one side, who controls this process and the process of expansion of innovation and sharing this innovation with others. So if you control, you get monetization. If you expand, you spread, you are sharing. And in the cultural sector, the tension between these two forces are very important. So, subsidiarities. So, you know, I don't know, the Louvre in uh, Abu Dhabi or the Guggenheim in Bilbao. These are systems of control. There is an innovation, I'm sure, but it is a controlling system, which is totally different what happens through training or, or counseling that we are 
sharing innovation ideas with our students, with professionals that are coming to our training courses, or when we publish all our results in open access based, or when we just are able to create new trends. Trends are the strongest expansion capacity element. And maybe you have to ask ourselves, what expansion capacity do most innovation have in the cultural field? I think that's something which is important to ask ourselves if we are drivers or not drivers of expanding the benefits of innovation to other fields. So, which are the priorities? That are the, the main question. No? Which are the priorities? So, we go from a sector, a cultural sector with its values, identities, creative expressions, heritage, legacy, socialization. These are the main characteristics, and we work with that. And we do that in a world where there are many drivers of change. Society is changing very fast. The world is changing very fast. Five years ago, when the award was created, who was thinking about the possibility of a war in Europe, of a pandemic that will close us in our homes, etc., etc. So we need to think about all these drivers of change. Social dynamics, globalization, geopolitical dynamics, political, regulatory, and governance frameworks, climate change, digitalization, artificial intelligence shift, etc., etc., etc. All these things are affecting us, and we have to reflect on this when we are pushing and driving innovation. And also, it's important to have in mind how we cross borders. That is our task, to cross borders, to think about geographical no spaces as a place to develop cultural activities. Social undesirables, how we work with social undesirables, how we push marginal expressions, transdisciplinary formats, participation strategies, artificial intelligence, ethical borders as well. So I think this is how we need to think in order to achieve our results. And we need to do that trying to maybe not answer how we deal with these dilemmas, but having these dilemmas on our mind. So risk versus sustainability. This is one of the main problems of cultural management. The sustainability of the project and organization, but at the same time, sustainability is connected to risk. Or legacy, in cultural heritage sector, this is very important, legacy versus change. Equity and social inclusion versus excellence and artistic value. Equity access to and data interpretation by artificial intelligence between large platforms and cultural organizations with different capacities and resources. It's not the same what happens in a small, in a faraway cultural organization, but what happens in large corporations, large museums, and so on. Institutionalization versus spontaneity. Passion and enthusiasm versus rationality and viability. Consolidate prestige versus artistic emergences. Cognitive effort versus entertainment. Cultural diplomacy versus horizontal cultural cooperation, and so on, and so on, and so on. These are some of the dilemmas we need to work as educators, as researchers on cultural management and cultural policy. We must rethink the kind of professional skills and the research topics that the sector most need and to transmit values and commitment. Which kind of values and commitment we transmit? There is a space for a non-stressful multitasking leadership in our field? <laughs> well, I think so. <laughs> I'm an optimistic, optimistic man. So we need to train cultural managers with this ambition to become open-minded leaders willing to add resources to obtain results, leaders able to give space to others, empowering them to innovate, sharing doubts, and learning together to make decisions as a team, but without stopping making difficult decisions and not escaping risk or uncomfortable issues. These are the kind of professionals we want in, or we need in the cultural sector. Leading is serving, not using others or organizations. They must know how to multiply with others, integrating them, letting them grow. Being generous and caring for others always gives results in the long run. 
leaders who know how to surround themselves with talented careers, open to learning, committed and enthusiastic people. A team who is not afraid of risk, but who knows how to accept failures with humility, out of respect for the team, the organization and the community, to avoid future mistakes. Talent always attracts talent. And I also can say, non-talent always <laughs> attracts mediocrity. <laughs> good projects are led by very talented figures, capable of attracting other good professionals because they inspire and learn from them. We must know how to retain this talent, but also let it fly when new projects and dreams arrive, so that from other projects continues to be nodes in our cooperation networks. So don't afraid if some of your best people around you decide to leave. The important is to be able to build networks with them because they will be always helping you as well. We also have to manage big egos. It's part of the cultural sector reality. But we have to take care of the rest of the team and get the best out of each one. I think that's something which is not always taken into account. We need to take care of everyone in the team. Even though we need these sometimes big egos that characterize the artistic sector. Managers who also know how to manage people with grievance, fixed knowledge, not very competent, demotivating, who blame others, take refuge in the norm, flee from risk and personal commitment, wielding acquiring rights. We also need to be able to manage this kind of stuff because not always we can choose our stuff. So how we manage them is also very important and it's part of the process. You have been listening to the podcast of INCACT, the European Network on Cultural Management and Policy. To learn more about us, our activities, and how to become a member, visit incact.org.